critical realist concept of open systemic causality combined with the idea of ontological emergence really changes the way we think about scientific explanations. Recall that explaining a phenomenon means identifying its cause, or in this case, causes. An adequate scientific explanation, therefore, is an account of how different causes and different types of causes interact in the open system and how they create tendencies for phenomena. Let's think of an example. Let's say you're a researcher interested in the factors that lead to better school performance. And you notice in your data gathering that as students get older, their school performance tends to improve. Now, a less informed researcher would immediately jump to the conclusion that age is a cause that leads to better school performance. But a critical realist researcher would be wary about jumping to such a conclusion. And the reason is we know that events are not causes, but conditions. So in this case, the age is not a cause that leads to better school performance, but merely a condition. So the critical realist researcher would ask himself or herself, what could be the underlying causes that are triggered by age? One possible answer is that as a student gets older, he or she becomes more mature and gains greater self-confidence, thereby leading to better school performance. Another cause would be perhaps the friends of the student begin to value and begin to look up to students who do well academically. And as a result of that, the student himself or herself may desire to be successful. Just by looking at this simple example and this simple diagram, we immediately see that explaining a phenomenon scientifically does not just entail identifying one cause. It entails identifying different causes and different types of causes and narrating how these causes interact with one another to lead to the phenomenon. Here's another interesting example. Let's think about depression. What could be the different causes and different types of causes that lead to depression? A person experiences depression, and we identify it in the diagram as event B. Prior to event B was an experience of failure, which we label event A. Now we know that the experience of failure is a mere condition that triggers the depression, but there must be other underlying causes. Today, we understand that for someone to experience depression, there's a whole array of different types of causes that may interact with one another, the most basic of which would be the physical and chemical causes. It's possible that the person has some chemical imbalance in the brain, or perhaps the person has taken some medication that has caused such an imbalance. There are also social causes like a dysfunctional family or extreme peer pressure. And of course, there are psychological causes. There are the unconscious psychological causes like fears, traumas, unmet needs, as well as conscious psychological causes. To a certain extent, a person can make a decision whether to change or follow whatever tendency towards depression he or she might already have. So in this diagram, we see how different types of causes, again, are interacting with one another. Each cause defines the possibility and limits of a depression, but it's their interaction that leads to the depression or not. Let's talk about one important example of emergence, and this is the relationship between society and its individual members. The problem with social reality is that it is inseparable from its human components. So the central sociological problem has always been this connection between structure and agency. How do we distinguish society from the individuals and the groups of individuals that comprise it? Are they identical? How are they related? 
Roy Basker's transformational model of social action clarifies the relationship between society and people, between structure and agency. The first big idea here is that the social causes are rooted in the psychological causes. In other words, society is necessarily made up of individual persons. There is no going around that. But the other big idea here is that even if society is rooted in its individual members, society cannot be reduced to the individuals. When people come together and they find themselves forming a society, then there already emerges a different level of cause, social cause, which is not the same and cannot be reduced to the individual psychological causes. Society has a causal power all its own. Structure and agency, society and people are two separate phenomena with different causal powers and properties. When you think about it, we can use the transformational model of social action, or TMSA, as some kind of template to make sense of the relationship across causes in ontological emergence. The relationship between the types of causes in our hierarchy of causes are characterized by dependency and distinction. The higher level causes are dependent on the lower level causes, but they remain distinct from them. They are irreducible. Here's an interesting question. Is a human mind a cause? There's a tendency today towards its denial. It's not a cause. There's no such thing as human intentionality. There's no such thing as human freedom or human agency or free will. This is really a tendency towards reductionism. One example of such a reductionism is this tendency to reduce the mind to overt behavior. This is, of course, called behaviorism. Behaviorism is the reduction of the mind to an event or experience, something observable, something measurable. This is a form of positivism, but it's also a form of actualism. It is a denial of the domain of the real because you're denying that the mind is a causal power unless it creates an event, unless it causes an event. Another form of reductionism that pertains to the mind is materialism, when the mind is reduced to its material ingredients, in a word, to the brain. According to ontological emergence, our mind is a causal power in its own right, with emergent properties irreducible to our brain. No doubt, the mind is rooted in the human brain. Without the physical brain, without a living brain, there can be no human mind. But according to the same concept of ontological emergence, we have to assert that even if the mind is rooted in the brain, something else is going on in the mind that cannot be fully explained away by the brain. The mind is subject to physical and chemical laws, but it cannot be reduced to it. It is also subject to psychological laws, which cannot be exhausted by physics or chemistry. For this reason, call it what you like, but the human mind, human intentionality, human freedom, human agency, free will, and for Bhaskar reasons, all this are costly efficacious. Our reasons and our motivations are causes. Here's a diagram that might help clarify what we've been talking about so far. So first we have human agency, which is a form of psychological causes. Now, as we know, human agency is affected by the physical and chemical, as well as the biological. Moreover, Human agency is also shaped by social causes. Now, what this is showing us is that human agency is rooted not only in the physical and chemical and biological, but also in the social. This picture seems to suggest that human agency is nothing but the product of matter, life, and structure. However, 
We know that the natural, biological, and social laws do not determine human behavior. They only provide it with possibilities and limits. According to the concept of dual or multiple control, human agency can act back on the material, the biological, and the social. We can enable or constrain their operations. So what is a human person? The human person is an emergent reality. Thinking about this question, I say, I am my body because I depend on the physical, the chemical, and the biological. But I am also more than my body because I am distinct from the physical, chemical, and biological, and I am not reducible to them. I am a social being. I depend on my social interactions and relationships and by all means, they affect me and define me to a certain extent. But I can also choose. I am also a causal power in my own right. This captures the paradox of what it means to be human. That on the one hand, we are products of our history, but on the other, we are also its author. There are three implications to the concept of ontological emergence. First, we must reject reductionism. The more complex causes cannot be reduced to the more basic causes, even if it's more convenient to do that. The second implication is the rejection of determinism. Because while the more basic causes certainly affect the more complex causes, the more complex causes do have a say in deciding how the more basic causes will affect them. And the final implication is the rejection of a theory of everything. Bhaskar offers the following principle to guide us when we're trying to understand or explain a phenomenon. According to him, the nature of an object determines its cognitive possibility and defines the science proper to it. Recall that the causes in every ontological stratum have properties that are irreducibly distinct. So every ontological level requires a distinct and autonomous science. And the reason is that ontological emergence holds that every science is legitimate and autonomous because the causes that they study are also autonomous of one another. This hierarchy of intransitive causes gives rise to a similar hierarchy of transitive sciences. So for the physical and chemical causes, we have physics and chemistry. For the biological causes, we have biology. For the psychological, psychology. For the social causes, we have the social science, and so on and so forth. A phenomenon in the open systemic world is probably complex in the sense that it is caused not by one, but several types of causes. Therefore, we need several disciplines and not just one discipline to understand and explain a phenomenon. So ontological emergence urges us to reject monodisciplinarity and to embrace interdisciplinarity. Mm -hmm.